Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my lecture series on sustainability issues in energy. Today, we'll be talking about our second to last lecture in the unit on geothermal energy. And today, we'll talk specifically about drilling geothermal wells and the various uh, techniques and engineering that goes into it. Um, again, if you've been enjoying these lectures, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and like this video. Okay, so to drill a geothermal well, there are really three main technologies that are used right now. There's augers, there's what's called a down-the-hole hammer, and then there's rotary drilling. So we'll talk about uh, what each one of these uh, involves. Each one is uses a slightly different technology um, and is geared towards drilling at different depths. So depending on whether you're drilling just, you know, a hundred feet for a you know a single domestic application, or if you're drilling, you know, but eight or ten or twelve thousand foot deep, uh, you know, hot dry rock geothermal well, that's going to dictate the type of uh, drilling technique that you use. So we'll start out with auger drilling. Auger drilling is used for shallow boreholes. Um, and you know, generally, uh, these are going to be located in unconsolidated soils or sediments that are very close to the surface. Um, generally, you can't go much deeper than about 20 meters with these things. Um, and the, the reason for that is pretty straightforward. That's just about how long an auger can actually be for it to operate. So the way it works is you've got a, um, a little skid here that has um, this um, the auger uh, mounted on a tower here, and this is the auger itself. And you know, those can't be much longer than again about 20 meters, and it's just a giant screw. And so, you, you may have seen these at construction sites, they're often used for um, uh, you know, boring holes for pilings or foundations or that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, you basically just screw that auger down into the ground. Um, you can use what's called a hollow stem auger, which is where the uh, stem right here is hollow. And what that allows you to do is you can drill the auger down to your target depth and then actually insert the, uh, the U-tube for a geothermal probe directly in there and then unscrew the auger. And then the U-tube is already down the well and you just kind of allow the borehole to close up around that U-tube and, and you're good to go. So uh, it's a pretty uh, simple technology. Again, this is really only for your very, very shallow uh, geothermal applications. Now, if you're going deeper, um, what's used a lot is this uh, tool called a down-the-hole hammer, um, and it is a pneumatic system. Um, this works in hard rocks, um, so where you're drilling in hard rocks that are, you know, hundreds of meters uh, in depth. And um, it looks like this. So it's got the, um, the hammer head is right down here. And it's got these um, impactors here that break apart the rock. Um, so you've got, uh, you know, an actuator piston back here that forces this thing down and it punches against the rocks and the rocks and these impactors break up the rock. Essentially, you're inducing shear failure in the rock. Um, it's a really simple um, system. It uses air as the drilling fluid. So the air comes down inside the drill pipe. Um, it goes through these valves and through the actuator, um, which you know causes the actuator to come down and hit the hit the hammerhead. And then the cuttings, which are the little bits and pieces of rock that are cut, are then circulated back up the annulus um, with the airflow. So uh, it's you know pretty simple system. The air is typically operating at two, somewhere between two and four hundred psi, and um, it, it works it works pretty well. The one thing that you have to um, consider when you're using a down the hole hammer is whether you're anticipating a lot of water to flow out of the rock and into your borehole. Um, you know, obviously you're using air to circulate the cuttings. If you've got a lot of water coming from the rock and into the annular space here. Um, that's going to disrupt the degree to which you can remove the cuttings. Um, and so uh, if you're in a situation like that, you're probably going to have to use a different drilling technique, which we'll talk about next, uh, which is rotary drilling. So rotary drilling can be used for shallow holes. So if you're doing, you know, again, a domestic uh, geothermal system, you can use 
a pretty small rotary drilling rig. And again, this is going to be for situations where a down the hole hammer won't necessarily work either because you know the type of rock isn't appropriate or maybe you're expecting to have fluid flow into the well as you're drilling it. Um, so the way it works, it's basically like a very small version of a drilling rig that you would use for oil and gas. Um, again, it's you know typically uh, skid mounted here. Um, you've got a top drive up here, which is the um, engine that turns the drill pipe. Uh, there's the drill pipe right there. You can see this is a very narrow pipe and it's going down into the well. Um, there are these supply lines that supply the drilling fluid, which is pumped down the inside of the pipe and then comes back up into the return line here. And the purpose of the drilling fluid is to lubricate your drill down hole and keep the temperature, you know, keep it from getting too hot. Um, and also uh, control the pressure in the well and remove the uh, cuttings as they come back to the surface. So here's an example of a tank where the drilling fluid comes out. Uh, it's got the cuttings, which are the little you know, ground up pieces of rock, and you can separate them out and then recycle uh, the drilling fluid. So this would be a drill rig that you use for drilling a couple of hundred meters. Um, you can also use very large rigs to drill much deeper. Uh, the type of drill bits that you use come in two different flavors. There's your roller cone bits and then your fixed cutter bits. So roller cone bits have these cones uh, attached to them um, and they actually roll. So as the drill string rotates and the bit rotates, these cones actually roll over the rock and each one of these teeth impacts the rock and it grinds it up. So there's either um, this milled tooth bit, which is good for softer rocks, or there's an insert uh, roller cone bit where the teeth are actually these little inserts here. Um, those are better for harder rocks, but those are going to be your roller cone bits. Um, if you're de dealing with um, you know really hard or really abrasive formations, you're going to use a fixed cutter bit. Um, these generally are going to have uh, little diamonds on them that actually do the do the cutting action. So this is um, a polycrystalline diamond compact bit or a PDC bit. This is very widely used in oil and gas drilling. Um, it's got these cutters here. So as the bit rotates, these things actually, they scrape off the rock. So rather than impacting the rock with these teeth or the inserts on a roller cone bit, you're actually scraping the bit um, uh, uh, across the rock. And that's what causes it to, kit, to, uh, to cut, excuse me. Um, there's also these um, um, diamond impregnated bits, which, you know, similar idea, you've got very hard diamond impregnations on this um, that do the, the scraping for you. Um, and then there's these, uh, these natural diamond bits, which are good for soft abrasive formations, maybe that have a lot of, um, a lot of silt or a lot of volcanic, uh, volcanic glass in them, um, you can use this. So these are the types of bits um, that you're going to be using to drill your geothermal well. So as a general guideline, um, rotary drilling and down the hole hammer are going to be used when the rock is relatively hard. Um, and an auger drilling bit uh, is going to be used when you've got very soft rock. So that's what this, uh, this y-axis represents. Um, the x-axis here is actually um, a, uh, the width of the borehole that you're trying to that you're trying to drill. So um, if you're trying to drill a very wide borehole, generally you're going to go with rotary drilling rather than down the hole hammer because it's more efficient for water for water holes. Um, but as the hardness of the rock increases, actually down the hole hammer can work pretty well for very hard rocks drilling very wide um, boreholes. And uh, when I say wide borehole, boreholes, you know, we think about in, in oil and gas, a lot of the time your, your borehole diameter is, you know, seven inches, seven to seven eighths, eight and a half inches, that sort of thing, maybe four and a half inches for production, um, the production, excuse me, production interval. But um, for geothermal, sometimes you can be over two feet, depending on what the flow rate um, of your geothermal fluids uh, is going to be to get the necessary heat exchange. So that's just something else to keep in mind. Now, if you're drilling a really deep hole, you're going to use one of these big rigs, very, you know, like what they do for drilling for oil and gas. And this is just a very large version of the rotary drilling rig we were looking at before. So again, you've got this big, you have a huge derrick here, which holds the top drives. There's the top drive. And then the drill pipe 
goes down through the rig floor and down into the ground. Um, here's some extra drill pipe waiting um, to be used. Uh, there's a mud pit here, which uh, holds your drilling fluid as it's um, being circulated into the drill string. And then uh, the cuttings um, are removed from the uh, from the drill pipe with this um, this circulation system here. So again, it's it's a pretty straightforward operation, um, but it's obviously much uh, much larger than what you have with um, a smaller um, uh, uh, rotary drilling rig. Okay, so the drilling fluid, which is also referred to as a mud, um, again, as I, I said earlier, the purpose of the drilling fluid is to transport the cuttings. So keep the hole clean, keep the bit clean, ensure efficient drilling. Um, you want to prevent chemical reactions between the um, uh, the drilling fluid and the formation fluid and also the rock. So you need to control the chemistry a little bit. Um, it does cooling and lubrication for the drill string. Uh, it minimizes the fluid loss. So this is the amount of drilling fluid that actually you might be tempted to leak off into the rock while you're drilling. You want to design your mud such that that doesn't happen. Um, pressure control, you uh, want to be able to keep flow from coming into the well while you're drilling it. Um, and also it provides some buoyancy. Uh, you know, if you're drilling 15,000 feet down, that's a lot of drill pipe to have in the hole. And actually uh, the drilling fluid can uh, mitigate some of that weight by providing some buoyancy. Um, so that's an additional um, factor there. So drilling fluids that are used in geothermal um, are generally very simple. Um, you know, you're not running a really fancy, expensive operation here. They're very simple drilling fluids, typically water-based um, and with some amount of salt uh, to control chemical reactions with the rock. Um, some bentonite, which is a type of clay that's done for controlling the rheology. So, you know, viscosity, uh, yield strength, that sort of thing. Um, and also maybe some polymers, again, to control the rheology. And the densities that we're looking at for geothermal, it's you know generally somewhere between 8.6 and 9.6 pounds per gallon. So not really heavy drilling fluid like you might see in some oil and gas operations. And again, that's because a lot of the time with geothermal, we're not drilling into really highly overpressured zones like you might be with, with oil and gas. Um, so we can get away generally with a lower density. Okay, so let's talk about some of the engineering um, uh, some of the engineering um, concepts and uh, concerns that you have to worry about when you're drilling a geothermal well. So we'll start by talking about stresses in the subsurface. So um, we can describe the state of stress in the subsurface with uh, three orthogonal stress components that are called the principal stresses. And these principal stresses are aligned such that um, they're, they represent the stresses acting on orthogonal planes where there is no shear stress on that plane. So you've got some background stress field and you can decompose that into your principal stresses, again, which correspond to planes with no shear stress on them. So you've got an orthogonal um, principal stress system here. Sigma one is gonna be your maximum principal stress. Sigma three is the minimum principal stress. And then sigma two is in between. That's called the intermediate principal stress. Um, in the subsurface, typically one of your principal stresses is oriented vertically, and that's just due to gravity. Gravity is always there. Um, the, then the other two necessarily have to be in the horizontal plane uh, when that's the case. Now, this isn't always the case. There are some interesting situations where none of your principal stresses are oriented with gravity. Um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, discontinuities in material properties, like in the vicinity of a salt dome, you can have a rotation of the stress tensor. But um, generally for, you know, for most of the things that we're drilling for geothermal, that's, that's gonna, be, uh, gonna be the case. Okay, so we can represent subsurface stresses in two different ways. We can do sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three, like I just described. Um, the other thing that's often done for shorthand um, is because one of your principal stresses generally will be vertical, we'll refer to that one as sigma V. And then the other two are going to be your maximum and minimum horizontal stress 
Um, so the maximum horizontal stress would be the larger of those two, and that's uh, represented with a capital H. And then the, the uh, smaller of the two is going to be represented with a, um, a small h. And often the vertical stress is the maximum principal stress the way I've drawn it here, but that's not always going to be the case. So why the stresses matter is because we want to design our drilling program in such a way that we can drill a hole through the rock without that hole collapsing and without actually inducing fractures in the rock. And the way we do this is actually by controlling the drilling fluid density, which we often call the mud weight. Um, so ideally what you want is you want the mud weight to be just right so that you get a nice round hole and you don't get um, collapsing around the sides, which is what you ha happens when the mud weight is too low. You get hole enlargement. Um, or you don't want the, drill the mud weight to be too high because what happens then is that you actually induce these tensile fractures in the rock. Uh, these are called drilling-induced fractures. Now, these are both bad. Um, in the case of drilling-induced fractures, what happens after you induce those fractures is that the mud actually will leak off into those fractures, and it compromises your ability uh, to maintain uh, pressure control in the well, which can be really bad. Um, in the case of having a mud weight that's too low, you'll start to have, these are called borehole breakouts, and the hole will actually start trying to collapse. And again, you can get you can you can get your drill pipe stuck. You can lose pressure control. There's all kinds of bad things that happen. So you don't want to be on either side here. You want to be right in the middle where you've got a safe mud weight. OK, so how do we come up with a safe mud weight? Well, let's do a little bit of mathematical analysis. So let's go back to our principal stresses here and let's consider um, a plane uh, that's oriented in the sigma one, sigma two plane. OK, so because it's aligned with the principal stress system here, there's going to be no shear stresses acting on this, so only normal stresses. Now, if I rotate this plane by an angle C counterclockwise from the direction of sigma 1, now this plane is not aligned with the principal stresses, and so that means there's going to be normal and shear stresses acting on this plane. And we can represent those stresses by something called the Mohr circle. So with a Mohr circle, what we do is we make a plot of normal stress on the x-axis and shear stress on the y-axis. And what we can do is we can take sigma 1 and sigma 3 and plot those on the normal stress axis. Those define um, a circle, and this circle is called a Mohr circle. And that is the locus of points that correspond to the shear stress and normal stress acting on a plane with an orientation to C with respect to uh, sigma 1. So if I go back here, if I know this angle and I know sigma 1 and sigma 3, then I can figure out where those points fall on the Mohr circle. And it can tell you what the shear stress um, is going to be on that. Um, on that plane, and the normal stress as well. Okay, so there is a failure criterion that we can introduce here. It's called the Moore-Coulomb failure criterion. And this describes with a given state of stress, so sigma one and sigma two, um, where failure will occur if the stresses are large enough and you have a, a plane that's oriented um, appropriately. So um, the, the failure envelope here is described by a straight line, and the straight line is given by this equation here, where the shear stress at any point on here is going to be a function of the normal stress um, times the tangent of what's called the angle of internal friction, that's a material property, um, plus the cohesion, which is also um, a material property. So um, whenever your Mohr circle gets large enough that you intersect this failure envelope, what will happen is you will form shear failure along planes oriented to C with respect to uh, sigma 1. And so what that looks like is if you start with an intact rock, um, if you're applying a sigma 1 to it and a sigma 3, when you reach this failure criterion, you'll form these conjugate fractures here, uh, which are separated by an angle 2 C. And again, they're a plus or minus C rotation with respect to the direction um, of sigma one. 
So if you know the cohesion and the angle of internal friction, you can figure out um, where failure is going to occur as a function of your maximum and minimum uh, principal stress. Okay, so to really understand the role of drilling fluid in this whole system, we also need to talk about effective stress um, and correspond it with total stress. So um, Carl von Tersagi um, came up with the, uh, the concept of effective stress and uh, it gets explained like this. So let's imagine we've got a granular material like a, a sedimentary rock. Where we've got a bunch of grains, which are yellow here. And then uh, we've got some pore fluid in here, which has a pressure U, all right? So what happens if I impose a total stress of sigma on this system? So here I'm imposing it vertically, so I'm squeezing it. Um, what's gonna happen is that stress will act on everything uh, that's in this porous medium, both the grains and uh, the pore fluid. Um, but what happens is that the pore fluid will push back against this stress with a pressure equal to U. And so the actual stress that is imparted on these grain contacts is going to be the total stress that's being applied minus the pore pressure pushing back on it. Um, and again, this assumes that the grain contacts um, have you know, infinitesimal area, so they're in point contact. Um, and that means that what this rock actually responds to is not the total stress, but it's the effective stress, which we represent by a sigma prime. And that's going to be the total stress minus uh, the pore pressure. So we can map this back onto our more circle diagram here. And rather than plotting the total normal stress on the x-axis, we're plotting the effective normal stress. So what can happen here is that if you're initially at a state of stress where your Mohr circle is not in contact with the failure envelope, merely by increasing the pore pressure, you can move that Mohr circle to the left. Remember, because um, the uh, if you increase the pore pressure, the effect of stress goes down. So you can move that Mohr circle to the left and eventually get to the point where you will fail, not by loading the rock, but just by increasing the pore pressure. So this is something we've got to be very careful about. So that uh, encompasses uh, shear failure. Okay. Now, the other type of failure that can happen is tensile failure. And tensile failure happens when your stresses um, exceed the tensile strength of the rock. And we can plot this on our more Coulomb diagram. And uh, tensile stresses, um, at least for, you know, in geomechanics, ten tensile stress is generally represented by um, a negative stress. And so um, the failure envelope can be extended down into the tensile, you know, the tension regime over here on the left. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. Probably the most common is to use this Hook-Brown failure criterion, which uh, represents this portion of the failure envelope as part of a, a square root function. Um, but when your Mohr circle gets over here and you intersect the failure envelope right there at that point, this is going to be the case where you'll form a tensile fracture. So your minimum principal stress is negative, so it's in tension. Your maximum principal stress is positive, um, and that will open up a tensile, a tensile failure. Now, we do this sometimes in, intentionally, um, we'll talk about that in the, in the next lecture. But when you're drilling a well, you do not want this to happen. Okay, so let's think about what the stresses around the well tell us about uh, what type of failure you might have. Okay, so our well that we're drilling is a uh, circular void in a uh, an elastic um, medium. Okay, that's a very simple way of expressing it. Um, there's a fluid pressure in there, which we'll call PW. And let's imagine we're drilling this in a rock where the maximum principal stress is, is oriented vertically. Okay, so sigma V is sigma one, and then we've got our intermediate stress, the maximum horizontal stress, and then the minimum principal stress is the minimum horizontal stress. The rock also has a pore fluid pressure PP, which is not necessarily equal to PW. So um, what happens is because there's a discontinuity in material properties at the borehole wall here, we can think about a local stress system here. 
Again, there's going to be three principal stresses locally there that we can decompose the stress um, the, the stress field into. And um, we'll call those the vertical stress is going to be the maximum principal stress. Um, but then there's going to be a radial stress, which acts in the direction towards the borehole wall. And then the third principal stress is what's called the tangential stress or the hoop stress. And that acts um, along the borehole wall. Okay, now we can write expressions for each one of those stresses in terms of the background um, stress field. So obviously, um, sigma v is going to be the same in both cases. But what about the radial stress and the uh, and hoop stress? So if we look down at in you know, in plan view at our borehole, what we see is we've got our background horizontal stresses. There's the maximum and the minimum horizontal stress. And then our radial stress and our tangential stress act like this. Um, so the radial stress is actually just going to be given by the wellbore pressure. So it's the pressure in the wellbore acting on the borehole wall. Um, you can go through some trigonometry and come up with this expression um, for the hoop stress here. It's going to be a function of the, uh, the background horizontal stresses, the, um, the wellbore pressure, and then the orientation along the borehole wall. So obviously the magnitude of this hoop stress is gonna depend uh, on where you are around along the borehole wall. This angle theta um, is an azimuth that's measured counterclockwise from the direction of the minimum uh, horizontal stress. Okay, so what are the limits of that hoop stress? So here's our expression for the hoop stress in terms of the other um, background stresses. Um, we can find the maximum and minima um, of this function by taking the second derivative of it. So I'll take the first derivative with respect to theta and then take the second derivative with respect to theta. And what we see is that um, the second derivative is equal to zero, well, whenever the, um, the horizontal stresses are equal to each other, which is a trivial solution. But it's also equal to zero um, whenever theta is equal to zero, plus or minus pi over two, plus or minus pi, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So um, when theta is zero, uh, plus or minus pi, so on and so forth, um, the second derivative is negative. So these are gonna be your maxima, and then plus or minus pi over two, three pi over two, et cetera, um, these are going to be your minima because the second derivative um, is going to be positive. So what this looks like um, a lot around the borehole wall is that the hoop stress re reaches a maximum in the direction of the minimum horizontal stress, and it reaches a minimum in the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. Okay, so that's a little confusing. Um, but one way to think about this is that the hoop stress is what's preventing a tensile fracture from opening. OK, and so a tensile fracture will want to open against the lowest background principal stress, which is going to be sigma little h. And so that's going to be uh, in this orientation here where the tensile failure will happen in that direction. OK, so that's one way to think about that. OK, so one way to consider the tensile failure of the rock is to think about the effective hoop stress. So now we're considering the pore pressure. So there's the little prime symbol. And uh, that's gonna happen when the effective hoop stress goes to zero. And um, we're gonna do that by manipulating the wellbore pressure. So all I've done to make this effective stress now is I'm subtracting the pore pressure. And so where this is gonna go to zero is gonna be where this expression here reaches zero. And I'm, I'm ignoring the tensile strength of the rock right now. Okay. So um, the, the property that we're controlling in this equation is the wellbore pressure, because that's the mud, that's given by the mud weight. Okay. So what is the upper limit on the mud weight that we can maintain without inducing tensile failure? Well, I'll just take this expression here and solve for PW. And it turns out that we get this expression here. So this is going to be your maximum mud weight or maximum pressure in the well that you can drill with without inducing tensile failure. And um, what we know is, since I said earlier that the first place where you're going to fail is going to be on in a direction uh, aligned with the maximum horizontal stress, we can insert um, theta equals plus or minus pi over two, because that's our orientation um, when that happens. 
Uh, and so we can get rid of this cosine two theta term here. And this tells us that the minimum wellbore pressure to indense, induce tensile failure is given by this um, expression here. And those tensile fractures will happen in alignment with um, the maximum horizontal stress, okay? So you gotta keep your wellbore pressure below this critical value so that you avoid these drilling induced fractures. Okay, now shear failure, on the other hand, uh, this happens when your wellbore pressure is actually too low. And so let's talk about uh, when that happens. Again, this is a review of our um, shear failure criterion. So it's when our Mohr circle intersects the um, failure envelope. Now, there's um, you can figure out mathematically the location of this point in terms of a bunch of the properties in here. Um, so let's let's work out an expression in terms of sigma one and sigma three prime, um, as well as the uh, cohesion and angle of internal friction. Um, so this is our uh, effective normal stress at failure. And so we can go through some mathematical analysis uh, here to come up with a solution. And one thing we can do is actually you can recast um, this uh, C in terms of the angle of internal friction. So we arrive at this expression here. And uh, this is rather complicated, but we are going to make this uh, slightly more uh, straightforward. Okay, so let's go back to thinking about the, the hole that we're drilling in the rock, okay? So we've got um, sigma r and sigma theta, and let's think about this in two dimensions. So we'll ignore gravity for now and just think about um, the maximum and minimum um, uh, stresses. Let's also assume that the horizontal stresses are equal because that makes the math a little bit easier, okay? So um, if we make all those assumptions, um, so first of all, the maximum um, principle, the maximum principal effective stress in this situation here in two dimensions is going to be the uh, effective hoop stress. And at any point along the borehole wall, that's going to be given by this expression here. So we've already figured that out. Um, the minimum uh, effective stress is going to be the um, radial effective stress, which is simply the wellbore pressure. Okay, so that's that's how we we arrive at that. We don't need to subtract a pore pressure in here because there is no pore pressure. There's just the wellbore pressure. So with those simplifying assumptions, um, the math gets a little more straightforward. We can cancel out a lot of terms, and finally, after some um, manipulation, we arrive at this uh, equation here which is a the critical wellbore pressure to prevent uh, shear failure, there was those borehole breakouts. This is the minimum wellbore pressure you can maintain. And again, it's given by the material properties, so cohesion, angle of internal friction, um, the horizontal stress, and then uh, the pore pressure. Um, and then sorry about this equation 211 uh, reference here. I think this uh, is a reference to a drilling textbook for my graduate drilling class. Okay, so to summarize what we just did here, um, when the wellbore pressure is too low, you'll induce shear failure, that's borehole breakouts, and that minimum uh, safe wellbore pressure is given by this expression here, and this assumes that the horizontal stresses are equal. Um, if the wellbore pressure is too high, we'll get drilling-induced fractures, which are tensile failure, and the maximum safe wellbore pressure is given by this expression here. Um, and both of these criteria that we derive, they neglect the tensile strength of the rock. We've got a cohesion term that's accounted for, but no tensile strength. And that's okay because it gives you a bit of a, a safety factor when you're doing these calculations. So you can use this information to come up with what's called the mud window, which is the safe mud weight between the shear failure limit and the tensile failure limit. And so um, there's going to be um, a window in there of safe mud weights that you can use that you won't cause drilling-induced failure over here, and you won't have borehole breakouts over here. So you want to figure out what that range is based on your rock and the state of stress in the subsurface. So let's do an example here, an example calculation. So let's assume we're drilling through a rock with a normal pore pressure gradient. So the pore pressure is increasing at 0.433 PSI per foot. That's just a hydrostatic gradient for fresh water. Um, the horizontal stress gradient um, is 0.6 PSI per foot. So that's how fast the horizontal stress increases with depth. We're at 3000 feet below the surface. 
we'll assume an angle of internal friction of 30 degrees, which is pretty typical for a sandstone, and then a cohesion of zero. So the question is, what is our safe mud window for this situation? OK, so we first need to know the pore pressure and the horizontal stress. We're going to assume that the horizontal stresses are equal to each other um, for, for simplicity here. So we'll multiply the gradients by the depth to get the, um, the pressures and the stresses. So the pore pressure is 3,000 feet times 0.433 PSI per foot. It gives us 1,299 PSI gauge. Um, horizontal stress is 3,000 feet times 0.6 PSI per foot, 1,800 PSI. OK, so that gives us those numbers that we need to plug into the equations. So the lower bound of the mud window, um, we're going to use this expression here. And so plugging in all the terms that we were given, we come up with a minimum wellbore pressure of 1,550 PSI. For the upper bound of the mud window, that is going to be um, the tensile failure limit. So that's this expression here. Again, plugging in the numbers we got um, from before, we get a maximum safe mud um, uh, wellbore pressure of 2301 PSI. Okay, so 1550 for the lower limit, 2301 for the upper limit. So then we can translate these into a drilling fluid density by uh, considering that these pressures are the hydrostatic pressures exerted by a column of drilling fluid with a particular density, figure out what that density is. Okay, so if we've got pressures in PSI, um, we can divide those by the depth in feet and multiply by a conversion factor of 19.2, and that'll give us a, a drilling fluid density in pounds per gallon. So the lower limit um, we see in this case, it's gonna be 9.9 .9 pounds per gallon, and then the upper limit is gonna be 14.7 pounds per gallon. So um, for this situation, you can drill safely with any mud weight between those two values, but don't go outside those values because you might run the risk of having some pretty bad drilling problems. Okay, so I hope that's been a good introduction to how we drill and some of the design considerations when we drill. Um, next lecture will be the last one in the geothermal unit, and we'll talk about high enthalpy geothermal um, and uh, enhanced geothermal systems and induced seismicity. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.